Hello there and welcome to Complete Games. I'm James and today we begin the note read through for Gabrielle on Genesis Part 2. Gabrielle is one of the colonists who's been woken up early from the Genesis simulation and he has already come across the path of NIDA in her notes. So if you haven't already seen that note read through, I'll leave a link in the top right hand corner. So sit back, relax and enjoy part one of the notes from Gabrielle on Genesis. I remember the days spent working my claim. With my own two hands, I dug a fortune from the earth. Then the Anglos took that from me, along with my land and my life. And so I fell into the darkness, only to rise again in purgatory. There, I found myself beset by monsters and demons in a delirium of otherworldly domains. While I struggled towards my expiration, an angel joined me and called out words of encouragement with a woman's voice. She asked me to join her in mortal combat with her adversary, but I chose to follow a second voice that promised me reincarnation and restitution. And so I woke again in a celestial garden, with a shining gem set in one of my new forearms. The voice of my deliverer returned then, to guide me to a set of some magical armour I'd worn in the afterlife. I knew then my trials weren't over. I wandered lost in that garden for some time, transfixed by its impossible sky. I could see that everything around me lay on an inner rim of a gleaming wheel that arched overhead, from horizon to horizon. There was another wheel alongside this one, and together they rolled through the firmament. The sight of them brought back something I'd heard the slaves singing about in the Anglo's gold mines. Ezekiel saw the wheel, way up in the middle of the air. Then I recalled an old image of a snake looping around to devour itself. Where had I seen that? In my adult life, I figured anything spiritual had long since been ground out of me, but that was before I'd been banished to purgation. I quieted my mind to listen for the voices of the exalted, only to hear from another soul lost in that garden. My magic helmet showed me a hidden door in the ground nearby. Did I dare enter? I'm not proud to admit that it took me a long while to work up the courage to venture underground. The trap door led down into some sort of mine shaft, shored up with the same kind of smooth metal making up the wheel in the sky overhead. Again, I felt fear. Before a young girl spoke to me from across the chamber, at first I had trouble understanding her, but somehow her words gradually became sensible. I thought I heard her call me Conquestador, which confused me until I remembered my helmet, and I removed it to set her at ease. As I did that, I realized she said something more like colonizer. I resent being cast into the role of the villain, but I saw that she wasn't afraid of me. I told her she shouldn't have risked leading me to her hideaway, since she was alone and unarmed. She waved away my concern and introduced herself as Nida before offering something to eat and drink. This Nida claims to have come from a long line of caretakers who have lived out their lives tending their gardens in the sky. She says we're under attack by some kind of invading force. I was shown visions of creatures and lands twisted out of shape in the other garden wheel. I felt pathetic and weak, once I understood how far outside my own time and place I truly was. Nida told me that my trials in the Neverworld that she called Genesis should have prepared me for our coming fight, but I was less sure. Then she showed me the colossal mechanical mules the caretakers used to work the land. How those can cut through solid rock with spears of light as bright as the sun, and I saw how we may not be as powerless as I feared. I finally asked Nida about the strange metal she calls element. I've been unable to keep my eyes off it. She said it was among the strongest substances ever discovered and that it powers nearly everything around us, from my magic armor to her giant mechanical striders. I felt foolish having risked and eventually given my life for a few pounds of gold. Now that I can see what can be done with this metal, it's hard not to covet such wonders. Though Nida said their miracles came at a terrible cost. She claimed element polluted the earth and that now it was polluting the sky gardens. I asked if this invasive force taking over our wheels had brought this pollution with it. Nida seemed surprised by my question, but agreed that it did seem like a strong possibility. That night I dreamt I was heating Nida's element in a crucible, fixing its volatile form into a material with endless potential. I poured the result into a mold to cast a blade hammering to fold the metal again and again to strengthen it and work out its impurities. As I lifted my blade to inspect its edge, 
I saw an unfamiliar reflection in its mirrored surface, the face of a sorcerer or cultist. I looked around myself and saw that I was in a vaulted chamber of some dark catacomb. The center of its ceiling was open to the bright, full moon overhead. From the shadows of the chamber, a disembodied voice praised my work on the blade. I woke in the warren of chambers under the garden, unsure of myself. Was I a prospector bushwhacked by an Anglo mob in the country of our motherload, or an ancient alchemist honing his mythical arts under the Mediterranean shore? Nida has been training me on the workings of the striders wandering the gardens above us. She says they follow their own will, but we can break them like gigantic wild mules and use them to storm the other wheel. I try to remind myself she's a clever girl from a long time after my own, but she still irritates me when she talks down to me as if I'm some kind of Nino Tonto. Maybe that's why I'm not convinced that I need to help her fight her invader. On the other hand, I set out the war to defend the ranchos of Alta California from Anglo invaders and those Mepiridos ended up killing me for my property. I have here a rare chance to revenge myself on an occupying force, even if I have no claim to these gardens or their mineral wealth. Maybe I can earn a larger plot of land on whatever world we eventually settle. We ventured above ground to look for the striders, and spotted two right away, roaming towards an outcropping of rocks. It was a long hike to reach them and Nida insisted on doing it by night. For the first time, it occurred to me to wonder how there could even be a day and night on these wheels. Did her people take the sun with them when they flew off into the stars? Before we'd come topside, Nida showed me how to use her magic gear to look around in the dark. It was distracting. I kept stopping and gawking at things I shouldn't be able to see at all. I took the lead since I was the one in armor, but the girl managed to keep pace with me. We caught up with the striders while they were standing snout to snout as if they were conversing somehow. They were so massive, it took my breath away to be close to them. Now I just had to trust that the girl knew how to tame those mechanical hulks. Nida stood at the foot of the colossal four-legged machines and fiddled with some device in her hand. One of the striders dipped its head towards the ground and I made a fool of myself by jumping in front of her. Even though I knew it was a machine, I still half expected it to snatch her up in its metal jaws and eat her alive. She shook her head at me with a smirk. Then she turned to grab the handholds to haul herself up onto its neck. From there she was able to scramble up onto its back, where a sort of saddle platform folded into place seemingly from nowhere for her to stand on. After a moment, the second strider dropped its head for my benefit, but I opted to follow the girl up to where she was standing on the first one. It seemed wiser to learn from her how to tame and ride those behemoths before attempting it myself. I spent the better part of the next day or two in cycles, as Nida would say learning from a girl as she put a strider through its paces. High on the machine's back, we rode it uphill and into what looked like Scrabland's ravine by channels she hoped were deep enough to conceal us from view. She showed me how to coax the machine into spearing cannon walls with light bright enough to blast away rock. I knew mining wasn't the point of her demonstration, but I couldn't resist asking Nida to drop the strider's head low enough for me to climb down and inspect the rock cut for valuable ore. I didn't find any trace of gold in the rubble pile, but a bright violet shard caught my eye. Something made me snatch it up and hide it away before Nida could notice it. In my dreams that night, I found myself back in the necropolis under Alexandro. No, Alexandria. On the coast of Egypt, even deep under the city, I could smell the sea. My torch lit sculpted images of double-crowned snakes, carved from the bedrock walls around me. I was carrying dead weight over one shoulder, an orphan, taken from the steps of the Serapium above. The deepest halls of the catacomb were partially flooded, and the cold salt water tugged at the trailing folds of my cloak. A groan of confusion, and the child at my shoulder struggled in vain against the effects of the mandrake root. I was confident in my doses she wouldn't be able to rouse herself from her delirium in time. No, what was I doing? I jerked awake on a canyon floor, staring up at our striders standing watch over us, flashing their blue lights into the darkness. I swore I could still feel the dream dagger strapped to my leg. All through the next day, the unease of my dream sat with me. I couldn't focus on whatever Nida was trying to tell me about the dire threat to her garden and its noble purpose. 
We would ride in giant machines across a landscape her people had managed to launch into the void. And still I was fretting over Summer Colt's scream from a thousand years gone. I couldn't be sure it was just a dream anymore. I'd returned to that man's skin twice now, seen the light of another time through his eyes. His life seemed no more remote, no less my own than the one I'd lived by the Rio de los Americanos. Which of these men was I? Both? Neither? Had I really been dragged back from oblivion to fight for the people of this undreamt of future? Was I damned to skip like a stone across history for my barely remembered mortal sins? Near dark, the girl was excited to show me something. She pried open one of the hidden doors and pressed her magic device against the machinery inside. I didn't follow what she tried to explain to me next. Nida said I was wired to connect to some sort of game she had made. From my time in the Shadowland, she called Genesis. Then she did something, and all at once I was in another world, in a new body. There were no wheels overhead, only a setting sun scudded with clouds. I struggled to understand. Had I ever truly been in Nida's Sky Garden? I called to her, but instead heard a voice of an angel I'd met in purgatory. The angel told me something important. Then I was yanked back into reality, if this was actually reality. Nida grinned at me and asked what I thought and I got sick all over the canyon floor. It wasn't too late to let go of the malice in my heart. That was what the angel assured me in the dream world that Nida dropped me into, the one with the setting sun. Speaking of Nida, the girl pouted for hours after I reacted poorly to the hallucination she forced me on. I couldn't understand why she had seemed to expect praise for what she had done. I don't trust my own sensations, my own memories. I wonder if I've ever left perdition, if this ring of gardens might not be another breaking wheel for my infernal soul. In the dark I lie awake, afraid to dream again, and I wonder if this girl is some demon designed to torment me. And then his voice whispers to me, the one who woke me from Genesis and led me to my armor. He tells me the angel lied. I was careless, and the girl found the treasure I'd been concealing. I'd taken out the shard of element while she was sleeping, trying to remember what my other self had done in my dream to fix its volatile form into a workable metal. I turned it back and forth in the dark. Its glow was mesmerizing. I must have fallen asleep trying to recover my dream memory, and left it lying out by my side. Nida warned me that the metal was dangerous to human flesh in this form, unstable. She demanded to know what I was planning to do with it if I'd cut myself with its sharp edges. She scolded me like a child caught toying with fire, and I snapped at her like a wounded dog. Neither of us spoke again for a long time after that. And that concludes part one of the notes from Gabrielle. Of course, we will continue with part two, so don't forget to subscribe if you're new here, so you don't miss any more ARK Survival content from myself. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games, and I'll see you.